Hey, I'm Lee Balkum, and uh, I want to talk some about what do you do during a separation? Because I keep getting these emails from people who are like, you know, we're thinking about doing a separation. Will that be helpful? And, and more worrisome, I get the ones from people who say, we're separated. Now, what do we do? Now, if you're separated, uh, let me talk about a little bit about you know, why that's a problem. Uh, it's simply a matter of capacity of connection. If you look at my quick start guide, I talk about the different levels of a crisis. And, and there is a substantial jump in the severity of the crisis, the danger of the crisis, when we go from living in the same house to out of the same house. Right, when you're living in separate places. And the reason is because suddenly you're beginning to do what I call a dress rehearsal for divorce. That's a separation. It's a dress rehearsal for divorce. And what you're trying to do is perhaps heal the relationship, but the kind of the opposite way, right? The healing of a relationship comes from restoring the connection. As we've talked about in some prior videos, I talked about that as the three levels of connection. Those three levels are there because you're in a disconnected relationship because, back to an earlier video, you hit the pause button, right? And, and once that is damaged, it doesn't help the relationship to disconnect further. If our goal is to bring it back together to restore the relationship, then you're, you're kind of almost at the opposite ends. This is my problem when people tell me that they're going to do the no contact rule. And I'm going to talk about this on another video about how damaging that is because it, it's been flying around for years on the internet. And all it does is completely disconnect a relationship. But set that aside. Let's come back to the story of separation, because when you separate, you're basically creating a difficult time of restoring the connection in any easy way. Now you've got two households and you're getting used to two households. And so when couples tell me they're going to separate, I have some uh, topics I think are important to make sure you've addressed before you do that. If at all possible, and let's just use that if at all possible, try to manage to have an in-house separation if at all possible. Now, I, one little side note of this, there are times when abuse has come into a relationship, right? And I always want to bracket this off. If there is abuse in the, in this, in the relationship, physical abuse particularly, I not please do not use my material or anyone else's material to try to restore the relationship. You need to be safe. That's the, the base level we all need is to feel safe and protected. And if you can't do that within the relationship, then you need to make sure that you are safe. That's that's kind of at a core core base level. So I'm going to assume that if you continue to watch my videos and use my program and, and everything else, that that's not the case, right? And in that case, we want to do everything we can to not have a separation that is physical. In-house, I mean, it's better if you can even avoid that. But sometimes when couples get to a point where there's some toxicity to their relationship, where they just cannot do that, then they need to kind of have separate bedrooms or, you know, you, whatever they need to do to kind of find their separate place and, and negotiate how that looks. So you each have your space. Now, I will tell you when people say I need space, I think that we completely misunderstand what that's about. Another video down the road, we'll talk about that. There's just so many topics that we need to, to handle here uh, to get you where you need to be. But let's just stay with separation today. Okay, so here are what I consider to be the kind of the 10 guidelines for following in order to uh, have a separation at least move you in the direction you want. And the first one is going to be one you just heard me say. Use separation in separate locations as an, an absolute last option right? If, if your spouse is going, the only way that there's a possibility that we'll ever reconcile is if we separate, okay. Or if the, the spouse is like, you know what, I've got to get out of here. Okay. I mean, you can't force somebody to stay and you can't force the, the situation, but if at all possible, avoid a separation in different uh, separate locations. Number one reason why? It's a dress rehearsal for divorce. Number two reason why, it's very hard to connect. And that's what's wrong with the relationship. It's disconnected to the level and you've got to restore that connection. It gets very difficult. So use separation and separate locations as a last option. Number two, 
Before separating, be very clear about how you will stay connected. This is one that I see, I mean, it may be obvious after I talk about it, but people don't talk about this. How are we, we going to uh, have check-ins, right? How are we going to uh, work on different levels of our relationship? How are we going to keep each other up to date about what's going on? How are we going to connect? So be very clear about how you'll stay connected. Maybe you decide to do um, once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, even seven times a week, whatever, um, meetings, right, uh, of uh, dinner together, d- dinner as a family, or um, you'll uh, spend time together on the weekends or whatever it is. Just make sure that you've actually talked about phone calls, emails, texting, getting together in person, how you're going to do that. And be very intentional about that. This is something you want to do ahead of time. It's always harder to catch up once the separation has happened. So get this kind of agreed to ahead of time. So before you separate, be clear about how you'll stay connected. That's the second principle. Third principle, set up regular meetings to discuss the practical issue that come out of your the fact that you still have a joint life. So what are the schedules, the finances, those other pieces of the puzzle? How are they gonna to fit together? Uh, regular meetings, I think, are often best done weekly, but um, regular meetings would be talking about what's coming up on the schedule. What are the issues that you need to look at financially? What are the topics you need to make sure so that things don't get um, uh, under each other's skin, right? If, you, if you're tired of hearing, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was on your schedule. That's tough. But it can continue to devolve if you're not careful. And so even those little details like knowing where each other is going to be or what needs to happen with the kids or meetings or whatever else that is, that's an important piece just to to keep it from being a festering issue. Finances, because that's a tough place for most couples to be. So you want to make sure you've at least covered those details. That keeps that from being the bigger issue. What about us? What's going on with us? Um, Sometimes you have to be careful about that in separations, but I I believe you can handle that by saying, you know, are are there ways that we can connect better in in the the midst of this time? And and that's a good thing to do. So uh, set number three, set up regular meetings to make sure that you're discussing the practical issues of the joint life. And you do have a joint life. You're still married, even if you're separated and there are joint things you have to work on. Number four, set up regular times to just be together. Uh, no talks about your relationship during those times or the problems. Just a chance to be lighter and uh, you know be have a, a kind of a higher mood relationship. So this is not one of those where you say, "Hey, let's get together and hash out our problems." I've talked about this before as being therapy without a therapist present, right? Where you get into the locked into these um, conflicts that you can't resolve yourself. That's kind of why they're festering. And so we avoid that, but maybe going out for a cup of tea or coffee or whatever, and just kind of having a nice time, taking a walk in the park or or, or going shopping for the kids or, um, you know, whatever it is, going to a concert together, whatever it is, just make sure that you set up regular times to just be together. Now, this is one where when people are like, I am not having any contact with you, no way, no how. I know what they really are doing is trying to set up the beginning points uh, of moving towards the divorce. And so this one kind of helps us smoke out a little bit uh, where somebody is being less, um, more disingenuous about what's behind the separation. But if you're trying to restore connection, doesn't it make sense that you have pleasant points of connection? So set those up. Number four, set up regular times on the calendar. regular times, remember we just talked about scheduling, schedule those times to just be together, not to hash out things, not to go over the hard details, but to just enjoy each other again, because that's connecting. Number five, commit to yourself how you intend to improve yourself. And this is kind of best case scenario, both people going, this is what I'm doing to improve myself. I'm going to go to therapy once a week. I'm I'm taking up journaling. I'm doing an online course. I've taken up a new hobby. Uh, I'm going to, you know, involve myself with whatever it is, right? Doing something that will help you move forward. Remember the second C of my three C's is change yourself. Find out where you're stuck. Find out where you're not growing, where you're stagnant and begin to address that. 
that that's a, a good way of beginning to be the best person you can be so that when you end the separation, you're bringing your best self back into the relationship and that you're both functioning at a higher level. Now, you don't have any control over whether your spouse does that. You have control on whether you do that. Take responsibility for your part of that. Commit to how you intend to improve yourself. It's not committing your spouse to improving. It's committing yourself on how you're going to improve to be a better, the best person you can be. Number six, um, and this is an important one. Avoid acting in spiteful, angry, reactive, or vindictive ways. Don't sabotage things. This is you know kind of where you say, oh, you want the tools? They're out in the front lawn. Go get them. You know, uh, oh yeah, I found those things you wanted. You'll find them in the trash can, right? Or, oh yeah, I've changed the lock. So now you try to come back. All those things are uh, mostly about being spiteful, angry, reactive, or vindictive. If it moves forward and there is some other issue, sure, you might need to change the locks down the way so you feel more secure about your space, but don't start with that, right? Many times people find themselves so hurt by this, and this is a very important kind of side note. When we are hurt, that's an inward feeling. That's our primary feeling. Outwardly, it often is expressed in anger. And we can justify that anger, right? We can tell ourselves it's okay for us to be angry. The other person deserves that, right? And so we justify it. But in the the fact that we are then pushing that anger towards the other person, what do they feel? Hurt fear, threat. How do they react? Angry. How does that make us feel? Hurt, fear, threat. How do we react? Anger. And it begins to be uh, growing on itself. And so what we're doing is in reacting to our hurt of abandonment, our, our hurt and fear of abandonment, and it leaks out in ways that do more damage to the relationship. So resist that. Avoid acting in those ways. Number seven, related, resist begging, pleading, or cajoling the person into coming home if, if they're the one who's left. If you're the one who's left, you know, look for an opportunity or an opening to, to come back into the home. But if your spouse is the one who's left, and if you're watching this, that is likely, not guaranteed, but it's likely. So you want to make sure that you don't beg that. You don't do anything that's going to be begging or pleading or cajoling the person, trying to kind of manipulate them into that it backfires. I promise you this. It will backfire. All they will do is dig in their heels deeper, deepening the resistance to coming back when you do those things. We're trying to create an invitation back into connection. Not a pulling, not a shaming, not a forcing, but an invitation. Now, the next one kind of is on a combination of those last two. Resist using the children as a bargaining chip. Oh, if you want to see the kids, you can come to the house. They're not coming to your place. Oh, if you want to see the kids, you need to move back home. They're not coming to you. Don't use the kids as bargaining chips. That's not fair to your kids. Kids need access to both parents. This is not about the kids. This is about the marital relationship. Don't make it about the kids. Again, that will backfire multiple ways. So just don't use that. Make sure that you create ways that both of you can spend time with the kids, preferably even as a family unit. But if not, that both people have access to the kids in any way uh, that makes sense. Um, Okay, so the next one, number nine, is to uh, make sure that for a constructive separation, you decide on a sensible time frame. I don't find it very helpful to have a, well, we're separated indefinitely. That just... Whenever you hear something like that, it creates all kinds of anxiety for people because they don't know what to expect next, right? You don't know how, how far out. And so people will often say, well, I don't know how long it's going to last, but they, you know, they signed a, a lease or leases can be broken, right? Um, and so look to set a time frame. Three months, that's a good time frame. That's a, enough time that people can begin to work on themselves, improve themselves, and then come back together. Six months begins to be a lot longer and a lot more difficult. More than six months is very difficult, but whatever the time frame you set, set a time frame. Just say, hey, okay, I get it. You want to do a separation. Let's agree on a time. 
Okay. If at all possible. Number 10, this is probably, um, look, count this as number 10, but also number one. Number 10 is begin the separation with the end in mind. Start with an understanding that the reason for the separation is to move beyond the problems, to secure a stronger and more connected relationship. If you start the separation by going, all we're doing is trying to find relief, you'll find relief. And then you'll go, oh, well, that works so well that maybe we never need to be back together again. But if you begin by thinking, where do we want to get to? Where you want to get to is being in a connected, loving relationship. If that's what you want, now let's kind of reverse engineer to get there. You start with the end in mind. I believe this is true in everywhere in life. You know, if I want to get something done, I know what I want to get done. Now I'll have to backtrack to get there. Otherwise, I'm spinning my wheels, maybe moving in opposite directions of that, maybe even counter to that. But if I am focused on where I want to end, it's a whole lot easier to back up and find the steps to get there. So start with the end in mind. If you're trying to get to a better relationship, then understand the reason for that, for the separation, is to make a better relationship. And the way you get there is to work to make it stronger and more connected. Okay, so those are 10 ways that you can set up a separation for the best chance of success. The one way to do it for the best chance, avoid separation if possible. If you can't, follow those 10 principles. This is Lee Balkan wishing you the best as you work to save your marriage. <laughs>